In a world of climate change, the bicycle is playing a vital role in reshaping the way people get around in dense urban environments. Micromobility refers to a host of small, mostly two-wheeled alternatives to cars and commercial vans. The pressure this transformation is putting on cities that for the past 70 years were designed to accommodate automobiles is increasing. Bikes, mopeds, skateboards, scooters, and pedestrians are demanding more and more of the available space. The conflicts are inevitable. Automobile drivers, who pay the majority of the taxes that pay for the byways of the city, are being relegated to second-class citizens. I recently heard drivers described as the new smokers, as in, yuck, you drive a car? Local governments are challenged on how to build the appropriate spaces for this onslaught of traffic that frequently spills out of its designated lane and into the path of cars, buses, and trucks. Bike theft is a huge issue that stops many from cycling to and from work. The more bikes there are, the more they get stolen. That's because bicycles are the perfect item to fence for quick cash. So here we are, at a collision point. Car bike tension, rules of the road, and theft. These issues will need to be addressed if we hope to get more people out of their cars. We invited Paul Dragon, the big wheel at Reckless Rider, to join us for a conversation that matters about the transportation transformation that is reshaping our cities. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. How do we address transportation issues in increasingly densifying urban centers? You know, we see, and, and the answer appears to be a greater and greater reliance on the bicycle. So that's a great question, Stu, because I think that everyone has be realized or is starting to realize that putting more automobiles and or trucks on the road isn't the solution, that, that we've, we've come to almost, quote, peak oil type of situation with that, is we, can't, we cannot physically get more cars on the road, or if we do, our roads become increasingly a parking lot as mm -hmm. opposed to um, a transportation avenue. So... Vancouver is not unique in that sense. Any major city in the world is struggling with the same issues. And um, it, we used to think it was simple. We used to think that, oh, well, we'll just ride our bike a little bit more. And that <sighs> bike is, is incredibly important in the, the um, puzzle, but it's not the only piece. It might be the key piece, but it's not the only piece. And, and what we're talking about now is what we would call micro-mobility. Mm -hmm. The ability to move around, primarily in an urban environment, you can yeah. use it elsewhere, but there's less of a requirement for it, to move around in an urban environment in a way that either limits or does not involve a single occupant see vehicle mm -hmm. so think of this is on the extreme end but think of a skateboard yeah that would get you from a to b think of walking obviously that gets you from a to b public transit is an obvious um but within that now we are we've all seen the rise of bike share we have it in vancouver it's in every major city in the world it's been in some cities like mexico city for 15 years mm -hmm. it's not a new thing but the new thing now is micro mobility an electric skateboard, an electric scooter, mm -hmm. a wheel with no handle on it whatsoever, right? <laughs> yeah, just a wheel just on a, a platform. Just a wheel on a platform. Yeah. So planners and engineers and all kinds of smart people are, are looking at this and trying to figure out how to integrate it into that urban fabric. So we get what, what I would call... Um, lots of transportation options or mm -hmm. lots of transportation choices but it's not easy um, and without having a uh, a coordinated plan to say this is the network of, of bicycle paths and uh, bicycle only you know um, streets and so on you wind up being on a bicycle you're zipping down in what you consider to be a protected environment and the next thing you know you're spat out into traffic and you're fighting for your life correct, uh, correct. and and I know that this isn't unique to Vancouver no. but there are some and then I look at 
I'm going to call out a couple of intersections where I go, okay, you went and did all the stuff around uh, making the uh, the bike lanes work, but the transition from one direction to the other, like at Quebec and first or whatever it is, or not quite first, yeah, maybe first, I come into that and I go, okay, now I'm, what? I, now, like... I'm stuck here for five yep. minutes trying to navigate a left-hand turn. Yep. Uh, Broad and uh, and Pacific, uh, or whatever it is. Um, it's Pacific. Yep. Yeah, it is yep. Pacific. Yep. Same thing. I come into it and I go, well, you spent millions of dollars on this. Like, it's not working. Like, yep. from a cyclist perspective, I go, I come into that intersection. I'm going to get hit from here. I'm going to get, uh, you know, cut off from there. How do we start to integrate? How do we bring the, the cyclist experience into the, the design of this? You know, it, it, look, I agree with you, and you can see that. And the one comment I might make is perhaps we might have even over-engineered it. And okay, that's a good, if good you per- are perspective. in Amsterdam yes. and you stand in at the train station, there is an obvious bicycle path separated by a different color mm-hmm. pavement treatment. There are no walls on it. There's no curbs on it. There's no anything on it. And that bicycle path goes by the ferry, which is in the middle of the people walking. And there is this ballet that goes on of people walking, cycling, turning left, turning right me stopped in the middle of the lane taking photographs and everybody avoids each other and everybody has a it's very 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 organic how that seems to work and in the space of half an hour that i was there there was not a confrontation whatsoever so Hmm. and is it is it the fact that people are paying attention when they're riding their bike, they're riding their bike. Because when they're it walking, hasn't they're been over engineered. Because it hasn't been over engineered. Okay. And if you ah. think of a place like Granville Island, yes. which is not very good to drive your car down there. Yep. And you could argue it's not very good to cycle down there. Hmm, but everybody I don't know. I gets find it easier to get everybody there. gets along yep. because the traffic is moving at a very slow speed and you are aware that there's other things going on around you. Mm-hmm. And the, 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 there's an antidotal story that if you take away street signs and have less of them, the traffic is actually safer because the driver isn't trying to figure out what to do. The driver does what he instinctively should do, which is slow down and pay attention. Right. So do you engineer it even more and more and more? That could be a North American solution. Is it the correct solution? I'm not 100% sure. Well, I don't ride up and down the, uh, the Dunsmuir uh, bike lane. For one thing, you've got a narrow space where you've got uh, cyclists going in two directions. Uh, and you've got people who have a really weird sense about what cycling etiquette is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll take Pender, thank sure. you very much. Sure, yeah. Uh, and I, yeah. You know. yeah, sometimes it's safer <laughs> to be out in traffic yeah. w- against the automobiles than it is against, let's call it, reckless people in a bike lane. But <laughs> However, this is not to yeah. take away from the fact that, that yeah. I think that this is an important uh, move towards solving so many of our transportation uh, issues, especially in the densest part of the city, the downtown yeah. core. So that yeah. bike lane when it went in and Dunsmere 10 or 15 years ago, that was a stake in the ground oh, yeah. that, that cycling is important and we're going to spend some money on it. Now, the, 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 I was at a workshop last week talking to some people and I said, we may, we may be planning for stuff that we don't even know what we're planning for down the road mm-hmm. because this whole dynamic is changing. And I said, think of Blackcomb 30 years ago. You showed up with a snowboard and they go, we're not quite sure what this is, but we're going to let you on this mountain. Mm-hmm. Whistler was saying, there's no way you're bringing that snowboard on our mountain. Yes. That was a revolution in the ski business that the regulators had to adapt to once it appeared. Mm-hmm. They couldn't make regulations for it before it showed up because they didn't know what it was. So for us going forward in the city, yeah. we may, we're always going to be playing catch up, I think. We're mm-hmm. going to be reacting. So the perfect example of that is dumping 4,000 electric scooters in San Francisco and then they figure out how to regulate them. Got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is brought to you by Audlem Brown, a client-focused investment firm that starts client relationships with straightforward conversations focused on you, your aspirations, and your investment priorities. Audlem Brown has been a supporter of Conversations That Matter from the day we started this show. 
Their only condition was that we provide a non-biased conversation with people from all sides of all sorts of issues. And of course, we couldn't produce this show without the support of Oh Boy Productions. If you're looking to produce a show like this one, I suggest you reach out to Oh Boy. They can help you produce it, and they can help you build your audience. And we also need your support. I ask you to please pledge $1 per show by going to conversationsthatmatter.tv slash donate, because those dollars add up and play an important role in helping us produce this show. Now, back to the show. So where do we go from here? Uh, because there's no doubt that we need to have more and more of that bicycling traffic, but we also need to have the appropriate infrastructure so that they can navigate their way through the roads, and then they can park them. Mm-hmm. So And safely. Yeah, safely yeah, is being a big yeah, part yeah, of it, because yeah. bicycle so, theft is another, another issue. So mm-hmm. this is, it's never going to be perfect, and it will be messy at some point in time, but I think if you move forward with the goal that we're trying to get to perfect, and realize that we're never going to get there, but we're going to improve what we have, or it's going to be improvement over what we had 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or even two years ago. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no solution here that is cut and dried. Yeah. But if you, if you change your frame of thinking and say, how do we make it easier to get around within an urban environment without excluding any type of current vehicle that we may have, including walking, Mm -hmm. including your scooter or skateboard or your bicycle. And how do we, we, it's, it's almost a carrot and a stick. Mm -hmm. The carrot is it's easier to ride your bike downtown than it is to drive your car. The stick is bring your car downtown. Parking is $20 for half an hour. And if you want to park it, you can do that, right? So mm. you're, you're never going to make it perfect. But I think, I think, and if I think if you go to a city in Europe that you go, wow, this is a great city. Because they have multiple transportation options. Mm-hmm. You can have a Uber, you can have a taxi, you can have a, a e-bike, you can have a bike share bike. You can take the tube you can take the bus you can take the tram car to the top of the mountain they give you lots and lots of options and you pick the one which is appropriate for you at that point in time Mm -hmm. so you may be walking all the way around that city and then you go for dinner and you have a couple of glasses of wine and you realize that you're you're four kilometers from your hotel you go oh you know what i'm gonna take a cab back you don't go you you just instinctively go, what's the best way for me to get home right now? Right. Cab's going to work. Yeah. So you were just in Amsterdam, which is widely recognized as kind of, uh, and I have to say, okay, well, is Beijing even more bicycle-centric than Amsterdam? But, But Amsterdam really is sort of looked at as, well, you are that city that went from allowing the automobile in and then went, Forget it. That was mm-hmm. a bad decision. Yep. Yep. We're now inviting bicycles back. Yep. But they went through all of this decades ago. Absolutely. So Absolutely. So when, when you take a look at the situation yep. in Amsterdam, what were some of the lessons that you come away with that you say, huh, we could benefit from yep. that here in so, Vancouver? Number one, there is no, no one calls himself a cyclist. There's no division mm-hmm. between I'm a cyclist and I'm not. That bicycle is a tool to move around. So that's number one. There's no, there's it's no. It's just transportation. It's just transportation. There's no fancy clothes. There's no fancy bicycles. It's just something to get you from A to B. And they're not racing one another on the street. They're not racing one another. Number two, yeah. it's very, very inclusive. So there are little kids on their bike, three and four years old. There are kids on the baby seat. There's a grandfather at 88 years old riding his bike. So it's nothing special. It's just, <laughs> it's just what it is. Right now. Part and parcel with that is they didn't eliminate automobiles. No. They they said, of course you can have your automobile. However, you can't park here. Or if you come down this street, you can only go at four kilometers an hour because it's filled full of other people. And they've made it easier to use your bicycle as a form of transport. And That's what they do. to use did. your car. Then to use your car, of course, and, and, of course. And we're doing that in Vancouver. We are, we are, yeah, yes. Yeah. But it's still not quite, um, it, it, you're still a little different if you ride your bike to a meeting, let's say. In now, Vancouver. In Vancouver. Yes. Now, it isn't like it was 20 years ago, 
where they where people would go really you rode your bike downtown to come to this meeting and you were dressed in a in a suit and a tie you go yeah i didn't go oh, that Stu, you know man he's riding his bike and this and that <laughs> right now it's just oh yeah i came or there's a non-issue yeah. they didn't right. they didn't ask how was parking easy i rode my bike oh yeah. okay or sometimes you're dragging it into their office because you're going i don't want to leave it well there's there, another right? whole yeah. issue right is, yeah. is bicycle safety you so know, how do we address that? Uh, well, I know it takes away a little bit from the focus of what we're yeah. talking about, but it is a big issue. I, like I, even though you know that's my bike over there, it's a it's an antique. It's still somebody sees it, they're going to steal it. I've had lights stolen off of that, water bottles. You think really? Come on, and that yeah. becomes. Uh, it becomes a deterrent. Negative. Sure, yeah. it does. Sure, why it does. am I going to take my so, bike? If I got to take everything off of it every time I park it. <laughs> Uh, that there's a whole nother issue there that uh, relates to our society and yes. how we deal with people who are challenged or underprivileged. So I would contend that probably close to 90% of the bike theft is drug related. Yes. That those bicycles are a form of, of cash yep. to buy whatever is the current crystal meth or crack cocaine or whatever. They're not stealing that bike because they like it, Stu. No. They're stealing that bike because they can sell it for 50 or or $100 and get what they need. And then four hours later or the next day, they're back looking for another bike. Mm -hmm. So because the, 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 the bicycle theft issue that exists in Vancouver isn't the same in Chilliwack. It isn't the same in Abbotsford. It isn't the same in, in Dawson Creek because we, we have such a concentration mm -hmm. of that, that what I'm going to call the drug issue, for lack of a better term, that those bicycles are a currency. Now, you know, if you leave your gym bag in the back of your car, the downtown, car's gonna that car is going to get broken into. It yeah. may be full of dirty gym clothes, but the guy doesn't know and doesn't care because maybe he finds a wallet. You now know the next time you go, no, I'm putting my gym bag in my trunk because mm -hmm. it's not safe for me to do that. Right. So, unfortunately, we are saying, Stu, you should have a second lock for that bike. Why yeah. do I need a second lock? I go, because you're trying to, you're not eliminating that bicycle theft, you are pushing it down the road. Yeah. Right? That's what you're doing. But, but yeah. so, you end up, you end up dealing with it because you go, you know what, the pleasure of me riding my bike or the convenience of me riding my bike outweighs the fact that this is a challenge, but you're also smarter about it. You go, so it is can, what it is. What can we do to reduce that? You say get a second lock. I talked okay. to the Vancouver police and they said you can also get a, uh, a number. That's right. The 529 program. The 529 right? program, which I went, I don't even know about that, but what is the 529 so program? So 529 is, is a, an initiative that was started by a guy in um, Seattle who had hundreds, or hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars of bicycles stolen. He was an exec at Microsoft. They were all sold on eBay. The police wouldn't do anything. He said, you know, there's got to be a way in this day and age to do something better. So he came up with an app-based system where you would register your bike online through this app. And the app is free. Mm -hmm. You download it on your phone. It prompts you to take a number of photographs of your bicycle, including one with your photo next to the bike and the serial number, and they provide you with a little tiny sticker that you put on your bike with an alphanumeric number on it. If that bike goes mi missing, and you take out your phone and go, my bike went missing, and it was on the corner of Georgia and Granville, and it's this bike, it comes up on my phone, and I go, oh, that bike went missing. That looks like Stu's bike. How about that? Yeah. So I'm riding around, and in the back of my mind, I go, oh, look, that looks like Stu's bike. And I look at it and I go, oh my God, it is his bike. So the police tell me also, if they see that 529 number, it gives them the authority to now apprehend that bike. They may not necessarily be able to uh, arrest the person no. who's riding it, but they're able to say... Uh, that bike you, doesn't you, belong you, to you. That and so, and if you protest, well then come and prove it. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, that's where the photograph of the bike... Yeah comes up because they pull up that photograph and if the guy holding the bike doesn't look like you and he doesn't have a reasonable plausible explanation, explanation I'm visiting Stu here's my driver's license yeah he let me right use he let me use the bike and here's his phone number right but but 
they 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 nab those bikes yeah right and now they have a method of getting it back to the owner because the vpd recovers hundreds of bikes yeah. oh. that they cannot return to the owner because the owner can't positively identify the bike the other thing that i want to talk about because we're starting to see them more and more on the road are cargo bikes and they will play a role in helping to uh, replace some of those uh, smaller uh, load deliveries especially in dense urban areas mm -hmm. But they also run the same risk of like, are, how do you protect yourself against them being yep. stolen? Yep. Um, especially when you've got a payload in sure. there. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So um, we can solve the theft problem through some technology, through some awareness, uh, or we can mitigate the theft problem. Right. We may not solve it, but we can mitigate it. But if you look at that cargo bike, and now you call it a bike for business as opposed to a bike for pleasure and you are DHL or Amazon or Canada Post or whoever, and you've got a fleet of 100 cube vans, well, you've got to put those cube vans somewhere. They stay somewhere at night. They yeah. probably stay in a locked yard at night. With a lot of real estate. With a lot of real estate. Mm -hmm. If you could eliminate 100 cube vans and replace it with 150 cargo bikes that cost a third of the cost of that cube van, maybe an eighth of a cost, that take up less parking and are more efficient at getting your package delivered. Mm -hmm. That's smart business. So to wrap up here, do you think that we are going to see a time, uh, and hopefully soon, where there's less and less confrontation between cyclists, drivers, and pedestrians because we still have that ah, for sure like, we will no, for no. sure we will so there's a couple there's quickly there's a couple of points number one it's a cultural thing yeah. that we all have to decide that one isn't better than the other yes. or one isn't more entitled than the other yeah. number two there's a there's an infrastructure engineering thing and you'll see that when the city brings out its new hospital district yeah. or its new uh, northeast falls creek you will see wider sidewalks mm -hmm. you'll see less parking more loading zones and, and drop-off zones, you will see more bike paths. So you can engineer it into the future. But, yeah. but the cultural thing is incredibly important, yeah. that, that we have to decide as a society that this is a good thing. Again, to go back to Amsterdam, <laughs> if you have an altercation with the car, by law, the car is responsible. That's how they've looked at it. They've huh. just said that if it's a bike and a car, the guy in the car is responsible. Now, I'm it, sure there's exceptions to it, yeah. but that's the premise or start. It's like no-fault insurance. That's a premise they're starting from. That's a tricky one. Right. Because so, you get people who ride bikes in pretty reckless uh, Oh, manner, of course you, know. you do. Of yeah. course you do. But you get people who drive in pretty reckless manner as well, right? Yes. So you cannot, you cannot say, oh, those cyclists. <laughs> yeah. Just like you can't say, oh, those car drivers. Right. Because there's, the majority of them are pretty good, right? Yes. But... We all, all want to get to our destination safely. Correct. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.